It's no longer about answering the most emails or pulling the most all-nighters. It's about prioritizing what's most important. Hey, Lexus, give me directions to Eagle's Peak Hiking Trail. Calculating route. That's why the Lexus NX has an all-new interface engineered to understand you and an available 14-inch touchscreen that's simpler and more intuitive. The all-new 2022 Lexus NX. Experience amazing at your Lexus dealer. Blog Talk Radio. You're listening to When Christians Speak Online Talk Radio, broadcasting out of the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. Today's voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. When Christians Speak is dedicated to lifting up the name of Christ Jesus and spreading the good news. Well, praise the Lord, everyone. I am um, super excited to share God's word with you this evening. This is Minister Vanessa Williams, and our topic is God's faithfulness still stands. Like I said, I'm super excited about his word. Um, Before we get into the prayer and get into the word, um, I think we have some new folks this evening, and I just wanted to share a little bit about um, this segment of When Christians Speak Talk Radio. Um, welcome to it, first of all, and, and this segment is called His Abounding Grace Broadcast. We're so delighted, so delighted that you decided to join us um, this evening. You could have been so many different places, doing so many other things, but you decided to spend the next 30 or 40 minutes with us, and we thank God for that. I also count it a privilege. I really count it an honor to be part of this wonderful network of brothers and sisters who are spreading the gospel, um, this network of When Christians Speak Talk Radio. You know, we expect your life, we expect your life to be changed in such a way that you will go out and help make a difference in someone else's life. That's what we're all about. So this segment, His Abounding Grace, um, was um, deposited in my spirit, and I just uh, decided to do some research on it. It's coming out of Romans, the fifth chapter, and the 21st. And the scripture reads, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And so that's where my title came, comes from, His Abounding Grace. Just an overview, His Abounding Grace is a marvelous gift that we oftentimes take for, take for granted. You know, it's because of his grace that we really get second chances. It's because of his grace that we are not consumed. It is because of his grace that the enemy is already defeated. So instead of using his grace as an opportunity to continue to sin, we should be continually praising God, giving him the glory through the precious blood of Jesus Christ that grace did much more abound. My prayer this evening, our prayer this evening, is that it would encourage you to strengthen your relationship with God. And for some of you who may not have a personal relationship with his son, Jesus Christ, our prayer is simple that this message will convict you and touch your heart to want to know Jesus for yourself. Let us go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for giving us another opportunity to serve you. We thank you, Lord God, for your grace and for your mercy. We thank you, Lord God, for being able to use us as a vessel, Lord God, to get your word out, to get your message out, Lord God. Lord, we ask right now their hearts and ears to be open to receive everything that you have for them this evening, Lord God. Lord God, it's not about us. It's all about you, Father. And we do give you the honor, glory, and praise because you and you alone are worthy to be praised. So, Lord, we ask that this word will convict where it should, Lord God. You said in your word that when it goes forth, it will never return unto you, Lord, that it will go out and accomplish that which you have purpose for it to accomplish. So, Lord God, we give you honor, glory, and praise. In Jesus' name, thank God. Amen, amen, and amen. God's faithfulness, God's faithfulness still stands. We're going to 
Main text this evening is Isaiah 43, 43rd chapter. Isaiah 43rd chapter. Um, you know, I know God's faithfulness still stands. And you may ask me, sister, how do you know that? I know it because what he's always done for me and that his faithfulness in my life has stood the test of time so many times over and over and over again. If you, to be honest with yourself, I dare say you would agree with me that God's faithfulness, not our faithfulness, but his faithfulness, his faithfulness still stands. Isaiah, the 43rd chapter, first verse, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. The second verse says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. There's no need to fear, for God has redeemed you. What does redeemed mean? Gain or regain possession of something in exchange for payment. So God, you see, has purchased you, and the price, the precious price, was the blood of his son Jesus, the crucified one. I have summoned you by name. You are mine, God says. He summoned you by name. Whatever your name is, whatever your name is, God knows your name. He knows your name. He calls you by your name. He knows everything about you. He knew everything about you before you were even formed in your mother's womb. This is the God we're talking about right now. And because of his investment in you, his faithfulness still stands. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. Yes, there are going to be some times when you may feel like the Israelites did when they were facing the Red Sea. <clears throat> With Pharaoh's army behind them, the Israelites, God's chosen people, they felt trapped. They felt there was no way out. They're looking in front of them, and there is the Red Sea. And behind them, behind them, Pharaoh's army is marching on. You see, you may be facing your own Red Sea this very moment. Perhaps there is a mountain of bills in front of you. Perhaps you are facing serious family issues, and you've prayed, and you've prayed, and you've prayed. Perhaps your body is wrapped with pain, and you've gone to so many doctors and gotten no answers or very few answers. And perhaps you've lost a loved one. Perhaps you've lost a loved one. Our condolences go out to you sincerely because it's, it's not easy when you're going through a grieving process. It's not easy. I know that personally. Perhaps you feel like all hope is gone, but just like he instructed Moses to tell the people when they were facing the Red Sea, listen to this, Exodus 14th chapter and the 10th verse says, And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were so afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. They doubted his faithfulness. How many times had they witnessed the Lord's protection over and over and over again before this moment? But yet, they questioned his faithfulness. They questioned it. When they were enslaved, when they were in bondage, God protected them. Yet here they are, mumbling and complaining to Moses. In the 15th verse, the Lord says unto Moses, Wherefore cries thou to me, speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward. Mm. Why are you crying? Don't you know who I am? Don't you know what I've already done for you? Don't you know that I never, never, ever would leave you? Don't you know that my faithfulness still stands? So God speaks to Moses, his servant, and says, God tells Moses, his servant says, but lift up thy rod and stretch out thy hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel, my children, my, my children, shall go on dry land through the midst of the sea. And the 17th and 18th verse says, and I, behold, will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them, and I will get honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know, hmm, the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten my honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. And you see, I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with this scripture, this story in the Old Testament, in Exodus, 
We know from this story that the Israelites marched through the sea on dry land. And yet, I can't tell you the number of times when I read this story, the number of times I was amazed at how quickly the Israelites, God's people, seemed to have forgotten the power of God. They mumbled and turned their backs on God. But what about us? What about us when you're going through stuff? Do you forget about what he's already done for you? Do you forget about the God we're talking about right now? Do you forget about things that he's already brought you from, already protected you from, already kept your mind when you should have been insane, but God said, not so, not so. Have you forgotten? And the verse says, and the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them, and the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. What about us? Have we forgotten that we're protected from the hands of the enemy? Have we forgotten that God covers us on every side? Have we forgotten that there's nowhere that we can go where his presence doesn't go with us? Have we forgotten that God's faithfulness still stands? God wants us to be reminded today. He wants us to be challenged today. Be still and know that I'm God. Be still and know that I'm God. I'm just here to encourage someone this evening. Be still and know that God is God. The word in Psalm 46, chapter, in the 10th verse says, I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. We're talking about my God. So I'm here to remind you that God's faithfulness still stands. He wants you to stand still when you're going through stuff. He wants you to stand still and know that he is the great I am. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. It may look like all hope is gone. It might sound like all hope is gone. But I'm here to encourage somebody today that Second Corinthians 5, 7 still stands. Walk by faith and not by sight. Troubles may seem to last forever. What you're going through right now, it may seem like it's never going to end. The enemy wants you to think that the trouble will last always and that your current situation will be made permanent. But I'm here to remind somebody the Second Corinthians 4.18 still stands. While we look not on the things which are seen, but on the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, that means temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So, my brother and my sister, don't be moved by what you see. John 1, 1 tell, lets us know that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This lets us know that God and his Word is the same. God's faithfulness still stands because his Word still stands. Now, I want to go to the Old Testament and give you a couple examples in the Old Testament, and then if time allows us, we'll move over to the New Testament Okay, but in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, as God was with Abraham, we'll see that his faithfulness still stood. Throughout Scripture, God promises to be with his people. He promises to care for us, to protect us, to guide us, and never, ever to abandon us. So even when you find yourself going through tough situations, remember God is still with you. Remember God is still in control. Remember, God is still walking with you, and it's not as long as it has been. Let's give you some background when we talk about Abraham. It's after the flood, that's after Noah. Abraham, a descendant of Shem, which is one of Noah's three sons. When you go over to Genesis, the twelfth chapter, I'm reading in the Living Bible paraphrase, God had told Abraham, Abraham, leave your own country behind you and your own people, and go to the land I guide you to. If you do, I will cause you to become the father of a great nation. I will bless you and make your name famous, and you will be a blessing to many others. The third verse says, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you, and the entire world will be blessed because of you. At this time, Abram was 75 years old when he set out following God's instructions. He was obedient to God. And God was with him. In verse 17, Abram is 90 years old, 90 years old, when God changes his name from Abram to Abraham. And God reminds him of his promise to make him a father of many nations. Genesis 21st, um, verse, 21st chapter, first and second verse. Then God did as he promised. 
And Sarah became pregnant and gave Abraham a baby boy in his old age. At the time, God had said. You just see, sometimes we go through stuff in our timing. You got to know it's not God's timing. At the time, God says, at his appointed time, we need to wait patiently for God. The third verse says, and Abraham named him Isaac, meaning laughter. The fourth and the fifth verse lets us know that eight days after Isaac was born, Abraham had him circumcised as God required. Abraham was 100 years old at that time. Now, because of God's promise to Abraham, he never left him. Yes, there were times when Abraham did things that were not pleasing to God, but God was faithful to his promise. He never left him. There were times when Abraham and his wife Sarah did things that were not pleasing to God when they took matters into their own hands, but God was, not, was faithful to his promise. He never left them. I'm sure there are times when you and me are not faithful to God. I'm sure there are times when we do things that is not pleasing to him, but guess what? God's still with us. He never leaves us. Isaac, Abraham's son, later married Rebekah, and they have twins, Esau and Jacob. Esau and Jacob. Jacob is the father of Joseph. Yet, there were times when Isaac and Rebekah did things that were not pleasing to God. How God was faithful to his promise, he never left them. I'm sure that there are times when our children may do things that is not pleasing to God, but guess what? God will never leave them. God will never forsake them, okay? Genesis, the 25th chapter, 19th verse. This is the story of Isaac's children. Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, 40 years old. Isaac pleaded with Jehovah God to give Rebekah a child, for even after many years of marriage, they had no children. Then at last she becomes pregnant, and guess what? She becomes pregnant with twins. And the 22nd verse lets us know, and it seemed as though children were fighting each other inside her. I cannot endure this, she cries, and she asked the Lord about it. And he told her, the son, sons in your womb shall become two rival nations. One will be stronger than the other, and the older shall be a servant of the younger. And sure enough, the 24th verse lets us know she had twins. The first was born so covered with reddish hair that one would think she was wearing a fur coat, so they called him Esau. The 26th verse says, then the other twin was born with his hand on Esau's heel, so they called him Jacob, meaning grabber, grabber. Isaac was 60 years old when his twins Esau and Jacob were born. Genesis 27 chapter lets us know that there was a chain of events occurred that would cause Jacob to leave his home and start on a journey that would change his life forever. A chain of events, lies, deception, and trickery. But God was faithful. He was faithful to his promise, and he never left Jacob. As he was with his grandfather Abraham and as he was with his father Isaac, God was with Jacob. So Esau says that he's starving. And his younger brother offers him some soup in exchange for his birthright. Now Esau foolishly agrees. We see here that Jacob valued the birthright more than his brother. He stole his brother's um, birthright. Because you see, during this time, it was the firstborn who was entitled to a double portion of the father's possession. And the birthright entitled him to become the father's head. Now, make sure you understand, God did not condone Jacob's willing and dealing, but one thing is apparent, God never left Jacob. God was faithful to his promise. God does not condone when we sin, but guess what? God is still faithful. So the 27th verse, one day in Isaac's old age, when he was almost blind, he called for Esau, his oldest son, and Isaac says, my son. Esau says, yes, father. I'm an old man now, and I expect every day to be my last. Take your bow and arrow out into the fields and get me some venison and prepare it just the way I like it, savory and good, and bring it here for me to eat, and I'm going to bless you, give you the blessings that belong to you as my firstborn before I die. At this time, Isaac was 137 years old. We later learned that Isaac lived many more years, so he didn't die as he suspected he was going to die soon. From one commentary, I read that perhaps Isaac thought he was about to die, 
then because his brother Ishmael had died at that age. The fifth verse, but Rebecca overhears this conversation when he's talking to his son about um, blessing him. So when Esau left for the field to hunt for the venison, as his father had asked him to, Rebecca calls her son Jacob, that's her favorite son, y'all, and tells him what his father had said to his brother. Now, Rebecca was being trickery as well. Rebecca, trickery was not really necessary, you see, because we learn from Genesis, the 25th chapter, and the 23rd verse, that God had already promised his, the blessing to Jacob. And the 23rd verse, and he told her, remember the 23rd verse, he told, tells her, the sons in your womb shall become two nations, two rival nations. One will be stronger than the other. And remember God told her, and the older shall be a servant of the younger. So she didn't need to help God. How many times do we get in God's way and we try to help him? He doesn't need our help. Oftentimes we take matters into our own hands because we don't believe God is hearing us or because we become impatient, or because we get tired of waiting. A lesson for each of us. So let's look at the events that Rebecca put into action by favoring this one son and taking matters into her own hands. Rebecca says, um, now do exactly as I tell you. Go out into the flock and bring two young goats, and I'll prepare your father's favorite dishes from them. Then take them to your father, and after he has enjoyed them, he will bless you before his death. He'll bless you instead of Esau. But Jake, mother, Jacob says, mother, he won't be fooled that easily. Think how hairy my brother Esau is and how smooth my skin is. What if my father steals me? He'll think I'm making a fool out of him, and he'll curse me instead of blessing me. Rebecca says, let his curses be on me, dear son, but just do what I tell you. Go out and get the goat. So Jacob follows his mother's instructions. He goes out and he brings the dressed kids to her and she prepares them just like his father likes them. And the 15 verse lets her know she goes even further and she takes Esau's best clothes. They were there in the house and she instructs Jacob to put them on. And she made him a pair of gloves from the hairy skin of the young goat. And she fastened a strip of the hide around his neck. Oh, she had it going on then. She gave him the meat with this rich aroma and some fresh baked bread to take to his father. This reminds me of something that Sir Walter Scott, Scott said in 1808. Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. We learn from this story that Jacob was able to fool his father, Isaac, doing as his mother instructed him. He lied to his father deceived him, and in doing so, he received the blessing that was meant for, meant for his brother. Now, although Rebecca planned the deception, Jacob was equally guilty for complying and going through with this. And we later learned that Jacob reaped what he sowed. Yes, God did bless Jacob because God does not go back on his promise. But Jacob did suffer the consequences of his action. Also, I believe Rebecca also suffer from this as well, because we'll later learn that she had to send her favorite son, Jacob, away so he would not be killed by his older brother. Remember, Jacob always stuck close to home. He was a mama's boy, always stuck close to Rebecca, and she had to send him away. Through ancient of times, God's faithfulness still stands. After all of the trickery, their mother Rebecca learns that Esau starts plotting to kill his brother Jacob because of what he had done. So this mother, who favors one son over the other, begins to plot again about how to protect her favorite son, Jacob. She thinks to herself, the best thing to do for him is for him to leave the area and give his brother time to cool off. So she goes to her son, and she says, flee, my son, to your uncle Lathar in Haran. Um, stay there with him a while until your brother's fury is spent until he forgets what you have done. Then I'll send for you. For why should I be bereaved of both of you in one day? Get this. In studying this, I found this very interesting. After she tells her son Jacob to leave, Rebecca then goes to her husband, husband Isaac and plants this ideal in his head, says he's the head of the household, to his, get his agreement. So she says to Isaac, I'm sick and tired of these local girls. 
I'd rather die than see Jacob marry one of these. So Isaac agrees. He doesn't know what his beloved Rebecca has done. So Jacob leaves home. And you know, it would be 20 years before he would return home to find that his father was still living, but his mother had passed on. His mother, Rebecca, never saw her son again. But guess what? God never forgot his promise to Abraham or to Isaac. He was still faithful. Chapter 28 lets us know that Jacob left home, and that night, that night when he stopped to camp at Sundam, he found a rock for a headrest, and he laid down to sleep. And he dreamed of a staircase that reached from earth to heaven. And he saw the angels of God going up and down upon the staircase. And at the top of the stairs stood the Lord. And the Lord said, I am Jehovah, the God of Abraham and of your father Isaac. The ground you are lying on is yours. I will give it to you and to your descendants, for you will have descendants as many as dust. They will cover the land from east to west and from north to south, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you and your descendants. What's more, I am with you, and I will protect you wherever you go. And I'll bring you back safely to this land. It will, I will be with you constantly until I have finished giving you all that I have promised. Mm. Talking about God's faithfulness, y'all. God's faithfulness still stands. God's faithfulness still stands. His promises are yea and amen. Even though we miss it, even though we are disobedient, God still blesses us because of his faithfulness. Just as he was with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he's still with us today. He says in the 15th verse, once more I will be with you and will protect you wherever you go. We see here that God visited Abraham doing a, a, a um, let me slow down for a minute. God visited Jacob during a time when I imagine that Jacob was suffering from guilt. I imagine his heart was, his heart was probably filled with regret for the past. I imagine he was probably lonely. He was apart from his mother. He was apart from his brother and his father. And I, uh, I imagine he was uncertain about his future. And God, Jehovah God, lovingly visits him in a dream. God makes a covenant with him as he had done with his grandfather Abraham and his father Isaac. Once more, I will be with you, and I will protect you wherever you go. Now let's fast forward to Genesis 29. Let's fast forward to Genesis the 29. Here is Jacob arrives at his uncle's house, and he sees beautiful Rachel. And we learned that, Rachel, um, that Jacob finally arrives at his uncle's house. He sees Rachel, falls in love with her. He works for his uncle in exchange for being allowed to marry her. We learn that Jacob himself is deceived by his uncle. He's tricked into marrying Leah first, but eventually he gets to marry Rachel. Paul, now let me, allow, let me interrupt the story for a minute. Remember what Jacob had done to his brother Esau? how he had tricked him out of his birthright. Now we see that Jacob himself was just tricked into marrying Leah when he had asked to marry Jacob. I'm sorry, to marry Rachel. I believe it's Galatians that says, Be not deceived, God is not marked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. But get this, God never left Jacob. For he kept his promises to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And in Genesis 35th chapter, we learned that Jacob did return to his father Isaac. So Jacob came at last to Isaac, his father, at a place called Hebrew Hebron, where, Jacob, where Abraham, too, had lived. And then Isaac died not too long after that, at the right old age, get this, 180 years old. And his sons Esau and Jacob buried them. Esau and Jacob did restore their brotherly relationship. God kept his promise. As he was with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he's with us today. During a time such as this, we need to remind ourselves of God's promises. We need to go back in time and see where God has brought us from and trust his word. We need to trust him just like he did for Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and yet Joseph, who we not talked about. This same God is still with us today, and his promises are yea and amen. From the beginning to the end, he's the master. He's the Alpha and the Maker, the beginning and the end. It's only when we do this that we will be confident that we can stand still and trust 
in the Lord. Lean not to our own understanding. God is God. He's the great I am. Let's go move over to the New Testament, the New Testament. Jesus demonstrates his faithfulness towards us and his role as our good shepherd, our good shepherd. John 10, 11, Jesus is speaking here, and he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Now, what is a shepherd? A person in the, in the physical, a person who tends, feeds, or guards a flock of sheep. He tends, he cares for, he looks after them, he puts their interests before his own. Jesus is our good shepherd. He tends to our needs. He feeds us. He guards us. I like to say Jesus is our security God, if you will. But he's, how many know he's so much more? He's so much more. John 10, 1, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that enters not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that enters in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter opens, and the sheep hear his voice, mm. and he calls his own sheep by name. How many know he is our shepherd, and he calls us by his name, and he leads us out? The fourth verse says, and when he puts forth his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Do you know his voice? Do you recognize the voice of our master? And even more so, do you obey his voice? The fifth verse, Jesus says, and a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Yea, I am talking about God's faithfulness. The Lord is our shepherd. Verse 1 lets us know about his faithfulness towards us and tells us that he is our shepherd. Sheepfold. Sheepfold was an enclosure in which sheep were sheltered at night. It was an area surrounded by a fence and having one opening that was used as a door. In a past pasture, there would be several flocks with different shepherds. I want you to make sure you get this. In a pasture, there could be several flocks with different shepherds. But it's important that sheep know their own shepherd's boards. For example, in the Near East, several flocks belonging to different shepherds may be in one fold, that is, in one fence area. But only a shepherd's own sheep will follow him out of the fold. Cattle can be driven, but sheep must be led. You see, in this world that we live in, there are so many voices out there, okay? So many voices out there. Let's say there's so many different voices out there. But if you don't know the right voice, if you don't know Jesus' voice, you may follow a voice that's not of God. And you may go and lift on a path that is not of God. Are you acting like cattle or are you acting like sheep? Do you allow the enemy to drag you away from the safety into his, his own camp? Or do you allow the good shepherd to lead you away from danger and to the safety of his arms? I'm talking about the good shepherd. You see, a good shepherd, a good shepherd will not lead his sheep into the enemy's camp. A good shepherd will not lift, a good sheep will not listen to any other voice other than the good shepherd's voice. A good shepherd will enter in by the door. Thieves and robbers don't enter in by the door, you see. They find other ways to get your attention. They try to distract you. They try to lure you. They try to um, take your eye, get you to take your eyes off the good shepherd. A good shepherd is always watching, always tending to his sheep, always feeding his sheep. Always God in his sheep. That's our Jesus. And the fourth verse says, and when he puts forth his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A good shepherd brings out his own sheep, but he does not drive them. He leads them. I don't know if you got that or not. A good shepherd brings out his own sheep, but he does not drive them. He leads them. He leads me beside the still water. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. A good shepherd. He does not ask them to go anywhere that he himself has not gone first. He is ever out front of us as our Savior, our guide. He sets an example for us to follow. As sheep, we should follow Christ, not go before him, not get in front of him. We should follow him. We should wait for his directions. We should follow him for we know, for we know that his faithfulness still stands. And when he puts forth his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him before they know his voice. Get this. The same instinct 
and enables a sheep to recognize the voice of the good shepherd will also prompt that sheep to flee from a stranger. John 10, 6, Jesus, this is a parable. Jesus is speaking, and he and his disciples don't understand what he's saying. And Jesus says to them, Very, very, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Jesus is making it plain to them. I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man comes in, he shall be saved, shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come, says Jesus, that they might have life and have it more abundantly. The 11th verse says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep, and we know that he did that for us. Get this. The 12th verse says, but he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, sees the wolf coming, and he leaves the sheep, flees, and the wolf catches them and scatters the sheep. The hiring flees because he is a hiring, and he cares not for his sheep. I am the good shepherd, Jesus repeats, and I know my sheep, and I'm known of my sheep. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life. For the sheep. You see, in verse 12, Jesus makes reference to a hireling. A hireling, H I R E L I N G, is a servant who is paid. Because he's not, he has no true allegiance to the flock, and a time of trouble, he's going to run off, and because he's working for money and neither owns nor loves the sheep. So he's going to leave the sheep alone, unprotected. Have you ever been in a situation where you trusted someone and thought they were there for the long haul? You put your trust and confidence in that person, believing he or she would take care of you, regardless of what happens, for better or for worse. But then trials and tribulations came, and perhaps you found yourself all alone. That's when you found out that you were trusting a hireling, someone who was only there for what they could get out of the relationship, someone who was only there for a little while. They never intended to tend to you, to feed you, to guard you forever. They were simply looking out for themselves. We have put your trust in a hireling, not in a shepherd. God's faithfulness still stands. How many know that a good shepherd would never let you down? How many know that a good shepherd would hang in there with you for better or for worse? How many know that a good shepherd would take your burdens as his own and allow you to rest? Mm. Rest and the comfort that he truly has your best interest at heart. How many will agree with me that the good shepherd has already laid down his life for you, his beloved sheep? He's laid down his life for me, his beloved sheep. The Lord is our shepherd, and his faithfulness still stands. Wouldn't you rather put your complete trust, your total confidence, your very life in the hands of the good shepherd, the good shepherd who tends to your every need, who feeds you and guides you? And again, I'd like to say he's my security God. But I also like to add, he's so much more. The good shepherd feeds us both spiritually and physically. Yes, God's faithfulness still stands. God's faithfulness still stands. His promises still stand. Whatever situation you may find yourself in this very moment, just rest, my brother. Rest in the knowledge that God's faithfulness still stands. When fear tries to overtake you, when you feel like all hope is gone, Isaiah 41.10 will remind you, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will withhold you with my righteous right hand. Embrace his peace. Isaiah 26 chapter says, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. My friend, when you don't see your way clear, when you don't know what to do, Psalms 32 eight is a good place to go. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. He always keeps his eyes turned towards us, his sheep. And my brother or my sister, during times of loneliness, during times of loneliness, there are so many scriptures that remind us, such as Deuteronomy, the 31st chapter, the 8th verse. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. When you feel weak, when you, seek, when you feel weak, you can seek refuge, seek refuge in his arms. 
you can be strengthened in his arms. For Psalm 46 reminds us that God is our refuge. That's a safety place, if you will. That's a safe home. And he's our strength, a tested help in time of trouble. And so we need not fear, even if the world blows up and the mountains come into the sea, let the oceans roar and form, let the mountains tremble, for God would never be, never leave us. Sometimes, sometimes you might have been lied upon, talked about, or unjustly accused. Isaiah 54, 17 says, no weapon formed against you shall prevail, shall prevail. It didn't say it would not form, but it said it would not prevail. And you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And this is the vindication from me, declares the Lord. God's word still stands. God's promises still stand. God's faithfulness still stands. God's faithfulness, my friend, towards us has stood the test of time. I want you to think about that. Think about that. He is our refuge. He is our strength, a tested help in times of trouble. So, my brother, my sister, trouble may be knocking on your door right now. Fear may be trying to overtake you. Sickness might be in your family right now, even your own body. You may be going through financial struggles right now. But I want to encourage you, all these scriptures I've given you, go back and listen to this message over and over if you have to, or other messages like this, okay? Because we're just here to encourage you that lean into these scriptures, okay? His promises are yea and amen. God said, I'll never leave you, my friend. I will never leave you. Turn to Jesus. Let him be your refuge and fortress. That's your hiding place during times of trouble. Turn to Jesus. Trust in his word and do not fear. Even if your world seems a little crazy right now, trust God. Whether you're going through, regardless of whatever you may be going on in your world right now, stand still and trust in God, for he still is the God of peace. You may be facing a situation where sadness tries to overtake you. Lean on Jesus. Remember the joy of the Lord is truly your strength. Just stand still and know that God is God. Wait patiently on the Lord. The, the Bible says the weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Wait for your morning. I say to you right now, stand still, my friend. Stand still, my brother, my sister. Stand still. God's with you. He will never leave you. The same God I'm talking about right now that we talked about in the Old Testament, all those uh, brothers and sisters of old, he's the same God. He has not forgotten you. He has not forgotten you. Go to God in confidence. With confidence, I say to you today, stand still. The great God I am. He's the great deliverer. The great miracle worker is with you today. I say to you, be confident in the knowledge that God is still God. Be still and know that God is God. And without him, there is no other. God is truly the same yesterday, today, and forever. He changes not. He changes not. Thank you, Lord Jesus. When you feel like your earth all around you is sick and sand, you need a safe haven, guess what? You have one already. It's in Jesus. It's in Jesus. The Lord, just like he fought for the Israelites, just like he protected the Israelites who were fleeing from Pharaoh, God is your protector today. I'm here to remind you that the same God, I'm coming to a close, I'm here to remind you today that the same God who said to Moses at the burning bush, tell them that I am that I am. It's the same God that I'm talking to you today about. This is the same God that says, stand still and know that I am God. I'm here to remind somebody, and I hope you've been encouraged by these few words, that the same God who used Moses to say to the people facing the Red Sea, fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. It's the same almighty God that I'm talking to you about today. God is the great I am. His faithfulness still stands for all eternity. Be, do not fear, for I am. I have redeemed you, Isaiah 43. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. God is so good. He's so faithful. He's so faithful. Even when we mess up, y'all, He's faithful, even when we mess up. In the midst of our mess, y'all, God 
is still faithful. And I thank God for sending his Holy Spirit. Jesus said he would never leave us alone, so he left us his Holy Spirit as our guide to comfort us, to protect us. Thank you, Jesus, for guiding us even right now. Now, some of you may not be saved. You may not have repented of your sins. You may have not have accepted Jesus into your heart. So I beg you right now, this is what it's all about, you see. If you are not 100% sure that you'll spend eternity in heaven, I want you to listen to my words very closely. Nobody can save you except Jesus. There is only one way to God, and that's through his son, Jesus Christ. John 14 and 6, Jesus says unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man cometh to the Father but by me. Acts 4th chapter in the 12th verse says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Are you saved? Are you born again? Have you made the confession that Jesus Christ is Lord? Romans 10, 9 says, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart, that God has raised them from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You need to admit that you're a sinner, because Romans 3.10 says, There is none righteous, no, not one. You need to be willing to turn from your wicked ways, that is to repent, and you need to believe that Jesus Christ died for you, was buried, and rose from the dead. But Romans 10.10 10 says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And through prayer, Right now, you, my friend, can invite Jesus to come into your life. You can invite him to become your personal Savior by repeating the prayer with me. For Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if you have not repented of your sin, if you're not saved right now, don't delay. Do it right now. Do it today. Repeat this prayer after me. Dear God, I am a sinner. And I need forgiveness. I believe that Jesus Christ shed his precious blood and died for my sin. I am willing to turn from sin. I now invite Christ to come into my heart and my life as my personal Savior. That's it, my friends. Now you truly are my brother and sister if you made that prayer of confession. If you trusted Jesus just now as your personal Savior, you have just begun a wonderful new life with him. Please send us an email. Let us know that you did that so we can continue to pray for you. You can send that email to His Abounding Grace Forever. That's the number four ever at gmail.com. Again, that's His Abounding Grace Forever, E D E R, at gmail.com. Then get a good Bible and get to know Jesus for yourself. Get to know Him. Read the Bible and let him speak to you. Talk to God daily in prayer. Be baptized. Get into a local church. Worship and fellowship with us and serve other Christians um, in a local church where Christ is preached and where the Bible, where the Bible is the final authority. And then don't be selfish with this good news. Run out and tell somebody else about Jesus. Tell somebody else about Jesus because that's what it's all about. Amen. That's what it's all about. Let us go to God in prayer. Lord, I thank you. Mm, we thank you, Father, for your word has gone out, Lord God. For the word has gone out. We know that it's accomplished with you, not us, but you have purpose for it to accomplish. Your word is sealed, Lord God. We thank you for souls that have come to you just now, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for them, Lord God. We thank you that others have been strengthened, Lord God, and encouraged by these words, Lord God, that they would go out and in turn strengthen and encourage somebody else, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for allowing us to just um, be vessels to be used by you, and we give you all the honor, glory, and praise because it all truly belongs to you. In Jesus' name, thank you, Father. Amen, amen, and amen. Well, until the next time, go out and expect good things to happen because God is faithful. His faithfulness still stands. You're listening to When Christians Speak Online Talk Radio. Broadcasting out of the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. Today's voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. When Christians speak is dedicated to lifting up the name of Christ Jesus and spreading the good news. Join us for our weekly broadcast. His abounding grace. 
with Minister Vanessa Williams. That's every Tuesday at 7 p.m. On Wednesday afternoons at 1 p.m., join Reverend Gwendolyn Dixon for the Midday Glory Prayer Line. The dial-in number is 641-715-3580. The access code is 732-499. And Wednesday nights at 7 p.m., Challenge to Change, where real transformation begins with you. That's with Pastor Paul Morgan of Chosen Generation Ministries in Richmond, Virginia. On Thursdays, live at 12 noon, join Reverend Pat Randall for Declaring the Finished Work for an hour of worship, exhortation, and prayer. Reverend Ray and friends are here on Friday nights at 7 p.m. with the joy of the Lord on Friday Night Joy. Sundays at 7 p.m., join Reverend Ray for Bread of Life for a word in season. And don't forget our monthly broadcast. First Mondays of every month at 7 p.m., be blessed with the teaching ministry of Apostle Shirley Jones on Lifeline. On third Mondays at 7 p.m., join Evangelist Louis McElwain for Adoration, a broadcast of worship and ministries on the mission field. Second Saturdays of the month, join Reverend Curtis, Reverend Novena, and Minister Jordana for Bold and Beautiful, a youth and young adult broadcast setting the world on fire with the love of Jesus. All broadcast times are Eastern Standard Time. Hey family, we are excited to have two new broadcasts added to the When Christians Speak Talk Radio Network. Marriage Takeover, The Body of One, hosted by Rev. Eric and Rev. Tamika Thompson. It airs every third Sunday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Our hosts cover a wide range of topics to help build stronger marriages. They leave nothing off the table. Our newest broadcast, R3, Real Life, Real Men, Real Talk, premieres Sunday, October 14th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and will air every second Sunday of the month. Our hosts, Elston Green, Cleophas Malone, Antonio Mitchell, and Ray Rose, will create a space by men and for men to have real conversations. It's time to be free, men, from false standards and the expectations of society, family, and self. You don't want to miss this first show this Sunday, October 14th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 